emergence of secularism is connected to the rise of the modern Western nation state, and it is legitimized by two main factors. First, providing a common denominator for all inhabitants of these countries to be recognized as citizens of our republic, and secondly, by defining a political stance independent of religious convictions. Three pieces of framing on this debate. First, the most relevant democracy. These are founded on laws created by the people, for the people, and not by a court, and have the core principles of freedom of thought and equality, therefore having to protect individuals such as women or LGBTQ minorities. And it's important to note that in this Western liberal democracies, we have extremely plural societies because of the influence of people from different religions that are right here. And so therefore, the state has a duty to these citizens to create a collective identity, uniting them like the one thing that they have in common, being part of this democracy. Secondly, on strict secularism, two main principles for this. Equal respect for all citizens and the freedom of consciousness. Why? Because on our side of the house, people are still able to believe in whatever they want, and we believe that actually by banning these symbols, these religious symbols, we would actually be encouraging religion to become more flexible. Why? Because these religions actually want to maintain their believers, and so therefore, in face of a law, they cannot be judging these individuals by things that are out of their reach. And so these religions would actually become more flexible in face of this law and allow these practices not to go through whether these individuals are wearing these symbols in public or not. And two operative notes that this strict secularism has. First, it's the separation of church and state. And secondly, it's the neutrality towards religions, therefore not being able to apply any targeted policies. And third, and how to find symbols. These are the ones that should be acknowledged by the religions themselves to be a part of them. And these are the bigger symbols. What are the symbols that? Like? They are hijabs, they are uh, kippahs, they are large crosses and turbans. And there is a very important clarification to make because we're very sure that the opposition will bring us the point about freedom of expression. But there, notice that there is a key difference in between expressing one's beliefs with words and uh, expressing adherence to a religion through these material symbols that only foster inequality in society. And so therefore, uh, since this is a measure in the public state, in the public spaces, it's important to know that the state is actually uh, has this in their jurisdiction and there are places in which we gather as civilians. And due to the multilateral of these spaces, it's important that states are actually there to say to us and promote social order. So, because in team proposition, we're here to defend all of the pillars that state secularism involves, uh, clarify the purification. We're here for secular impartiality, religious integration, through civil inclusiveness, and an active role of the state to create and continue sustaining communities of citizens. And therefore, you can expect us to prove two main things. First, that there is legitimacy to enact these policies in the public spaces. And secondly, that if we recognize as believers as citizens first, we actually integrate them more and reduce demonization. So, we are going to present three main arguments today. First, how we need security for equality and to actually benefit in these religions themselves. And secondly, how we promote assimilation. And third, how we actually get greater freedom of thought in our set of house. So, moving on to our first argument, how strict secularism is actually needed for a positive impact on states and religions. Why? Let's notice that these two uh, st stakeholders have different incentives. The state wants to promote equality and wants to promote social order and cohesion. And religions want to maintain or gain believers and followers. And so, opposition will either have to defend one or two of two worlds. First, um, work with an official state religion such as the UK, in which we see 26 unelected bishops uh, passing laws for the entirety of the UK, which we believe that is fundamentally anti-democratic and looks against the, pr the principle of democratic representation and equality, or second, uh, one in which we have weak secularism, in which states are inevitably tainted by these dogmatic values. Why? Because there are inherent contradictions in these religions, in these plural societies, of what constitutes a good life. I'll take it. Religion is a common expression of people. If they choose to vote in the face of religion, this is their identity becomes from the people without Okay, them. I understand. The problem is that religions themselves become affected by this. Because if religions become political tools, they are undermining the transcendental factor of religion that is so deemed as important by team by team opposition. But so, going back to my point, if we have different views on what constitutes a good life, then these citizens would not be being treated as equal by a, by a state that has political discord that is abstracted from religion, but instead they will be affected because the states are prone to be protecting or benefiting one religion over the other, whether this is a preferred religion or a majority religion. Historically, it has been done with capitalism, and therefore deeming the rest of the plural society as second-class citizens, encouraging segregation, differentiating them by the different accommodations that are provided to each of these religions. Then, our point on how we actually uh, benefit discourse on our side of the house. Because of the prevalence of the dogmatic rhetoric that we have on their side of the house, uh, we, uh, our discussions become unwanted. And therefore, we have a liberal state that is accepting things such as the premise that being gay is a sin or that sex education should be banned in schools simply because of divine explanations. And therefore, what are the impacts of this? The state has actually no political autonomy and cedes this public space to the religious plurality. And this becomes even worse than because we are reinforcing the differentiation. That 
that the state makes and not considering them as equal citizens but actually as part of these religious groups and therefore we lack order and religion. And how this actually affects religions themselves? We have seen examples in France and Canada of these religions asking to be separated from the state. Why? And going back to the point of information. Because these religions can become political tools. If they become political tools, if they are used by politicians so as to gain voters, then these uh, religions are actually undermined. What makes them transcendental and so important for individuals loses value, and they also risk their reputation. The risk their reputation being ruined when you have politicians waving around a cross in order to make statements against gay people or against abortion, because in a liberal state, those views are looked down upon because precisely they are anti-liberal, and so therefore the image of this religion is worsened, and they would be losing followers in a society that is already declining in believers and so therefore being affecting the interests of religions themselves. And so in our side of the house, what we have is policies being enacted uh, without the noise of this uh, religious factor being integrated. And we also have a strong state that promotes equality at core in order to give other certain liberties afterwards. And we are also protecting the interests of religions themselves. And our second argument on integration, we all know that prejudice against religious groups exists. We cannot deny that in a society. And particularly when we remember the plural nature of Western liberal democracies and how team opposition will be feeding this group of prejudice by uh, continuing funding schools that separate these religious groups from society that make them grow separate, only exposed to those with the same faith as them, this actually grows even worse. And not only because of the separation, but because of the inherent contradictions that we have in different religions, there are tensions within these groups. And because if the state becomes partial, these tensions are even more increased. The impact are twofold. First, we have a harm to religious individuals, and secondly, we have a disruption of public order. And why are symbols the tipping point? Because at best, we are getting these groups segregated, and if in, in religious situations that are more extreme, we have a conflict. Why? Because at the first glance, we're only seeing, uh, rather than an equal citizen, a person with a religious affiliation that is different than ours, and therefore we are more likely not to approach them because we have these own prejudices and not demanding stereotypes. Therefore, in France and the US, we have seen that most actions of Islamophobia, 90% of them, in fact, are committed against Muslim women who are wearing hijabs publicly because the hatred exists, and this symbol just makes an easy target for these people to be expressing this hatred. And because of the legitimate uh, believe that the state can actually regulate these public spaces in order to promote cohesion because opposition will try, you, they will try to tell you that the response to this plurality is actually one that segregates individuals further and secularism being the only response so as to uphold equality and the values of Western liberal democracy is so critical. A Muslim basketball player that has played since she was five was forbidden from competing because she wears hijab. Do you know how this woman felt when they made her trade off her purpose, her belief in God, to her aspiration and her goals in life? This is a trade off that nobody should be forced to make, and that's why science proposition opposes the straight state's pluralism. Three arguments will come from science proposition. Firstly, why this policy is simply principle that Secondly, why the believer's reaction will be in, uh, expressed in either dissatisfaction or isolation. And thirdly, which will come to our second speech, which will, uh, this church will get more coercive due to this policy. The recognizing of our organization. The policy of strict pluralism is principal interest. The first principle that gets infringed by this policy is the right of identity. The right of identity is a fundamental right to define ourselves. How I act and how I feel helps defining and shape who am I to decide. For example, it's not enough for trans people to just think that they are trans, but we let them go through cosmetic surgeries that help them look like the gender they want to, just to feel more like this gender. The right of identity is infringed upon when people are not allowed to show their ways to clothing or to hear to scripture to pray. The second principle that gets infringed by the policy is the right of dignity. Everyone here has the right to be treated with honor and respect, like a human being and to feel humane, like, like, like their life is worth it. Religious people achieve it through religion, as it gives them a purpose, a sense of humanity, a promise for a better future if they oblige by its way. Alternatively, they are forced under the threat of sin, which the great translates to loss of honor, loss of loss of respect, or even loss of their humanity. Many sacraments, for example, like the Bible, 
from portraying seeing people, a simple people, to animals, striking them out of their human dignity. This principle is getting broken by this state pluralism, as religious people feel as if they are deprived of their humanity, of their dignity, by the state, as it forbids them to the right to be righteously religious, and they are put under the existential threat of eternal suffering. But even if the proposition is able to prove that this, uh, that this policy abstractly is moral, here is why we think why this policy will be implemented in an immoral way, on two levels. First, the government will implement it in a discriminating towards the this way. Notice how in Western democracies right now, it's not perfect. There was a rise of right-wing uh, politicians there that utilized migrant report, that filed uh, the bill rise minorities. People like Georgia Maloney for Italy, uh, Le Pen in France, even Donald Trump in USA are all people that are willing to formulate these laws. In a way, it restricts minorities far more than it restricts the, the uh, dominant uh, uh, religion there. Why? Because that's what they're supposed to Therefore, if free securitism is to be implemented, the policy language will be in this proportion to cash and towards religious minorities. But even if we assume the, 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 the government will legislate in the best way possible, here is why the people enforcing the policy will do it in a bad way. Probably the police officers will, do, will be much more harsher towards Muslim wearing a hijab rather than the Christian wearing a cross, simply because the majority of policemen out there uh, in the Western countries are Christians. Why? Because Christianity is the dominant religion in the, in the Western countries. Therefore, they are more likely to be more accepted towards a Christian wearing a cross because they understand them more. They relate to them more. He's part of your community. He has the same beliefs as you. But I cannot understand the how Muslim things. I cannot understand this hijab thing, so I was a say first as a radical later, as a radical policeman. Therefore, I'm looking to, uh, therefore, the police aggression on race, police aggression towards minorities is something happening in the Western world right now. It's uh, that's literally why Black Lives Matter started in USA four years ago, for example. What I have for of this argument is simply, firstly, that this Simply the idea of this policy is just uh, is morally unjustified. But even if it is, it will be implemented in a normal way. Before explaining the uh, after explaining the lack of principality and justification in this policy, uh, I will move to the, the, the practical part of this policy. But before that, I'll give you why. How can you claim to be protecting these individuals from being struck from their dignity when they are here being violated against because of where they're supposed to be in the public areas? The principle is for you to be able to express whatever you want. The fact that the, the, we're, uh, we're allowing people, for example, people to do things to, to like to like tap the like battles that maybe are not very good for them in the future they don't like it, but we're allowing this. Why? Because it is inherently good for them to be able to express how they feel, how they think. The so the, the, the sole purpose, uh, the sole existing of this principle is to be able to allow these people. To explain to express themselves. Now to the practical part of this policy. Why the legal distraction will be expressed in either dissatisfaction or isolation? First of all, people care so much about this policy. Firstly, as for the first time people have already explained, people feel actively dehumanized due to this policy. They feel like they have to choose between committing a sin and going to hell or committing or, or, uh, or, or going to the jail. Therefore, this is literally uh, this is a um, the restriction. Of their, uh, of their freedom that is imposed, that is very affecting them, therefore they take it very seriously. But secondly, they feel antagonized because they live under a system of oppression, because their freedom are inflicted. No. Notice how, uh, notice how this won't go on notice. Firstly, because religious leaders are likely to utilize, um, uh, are likely to utilize this and use the pressure to the state. But secondly, people are likely, uh, likely to cause people to act because religion is something that important for them, because they are that deeply affected by this policy. So what do happen in a moment, no. what do happen in the moment in which uh, you, you as a religious person are restricted from expressing your, your, your religion? And notice how this is not only you wearing a cross in, uh, under your, your, your clothes, but it's also like wearing a hijab, something that is written in the Quran that you are supposed to do. What part do you have? Firstly, short-term, uh, short-term, short-term, there are two alternatives. But 
backlash and cancellation. Now the backlash part. Probably protesters of, uh, or other forms of, uh, probably there will be protests or other forms of resistance, uh, and no matter how peaceful they are trying to be, the level of the violence is high. Firstly, because emotions are already uh, very high uh, out there, like it's simply because it's policy, so affecting of those people out there, so, uh, and it's very important for them. Therefore, some of these communications can go up and can pretty quickly. But secondly, radical actors often partake in such demonstrations trying to initiate acts of aggression. Carol Rittenhouse has literally killed three people just to provoke aggression towards black people, like, like I've said uh, four or three years ago. But what is the uh, that aspiration point, like the second problem? What, uh, what is more likely? A Muslim woman to take her hijab and commit diplomacy or not going to school or job? The latter one is more likely simply because to them suffering in hell is more important uh, than getting their bachelor's degree. Bottom line of this, probably has to step behind a policy which actively puts innocent minorities in home arrest. Dear Fanel, opposition believes that people deserve to be able to believe and express their beliefs. Believers deserve to not create fear that they will go to hell. Muslim women deserve to go out of their homes and people overall deserve to know that problems. If you agree with that, uh, with this, please vote. I think it is incredibly telling that opposition actually supports a measure that only hinders and totally undermines the civil liberties that they on their side seem to be protecting. That's why we wouldn't be more happy to propose to today's motion. Three main things I will do in my speech. First of all, responses for opposition's case material, followed by the reminding of our views and reminding of moving on to our third and last two pieces of substance. So, first of all, um, regarding refutations, three main points here. The first one regarding the symbols and identity, the second one on discrimination, and the third one on abuse and influence by the majority. First of all, regarding symbols, note how from the opposition side we heard this idea of um, people wanting to actually look like the like they want to have their identity portrayed in public sphere. Now, what we tell you is that first of all, they, these people still feel like they can carry out their practice, they still can carry out their religion. These people are not prohibited to carry out their different practices in the private sphere. Now, we have to maintain a secular identity, we have to maintain a secular public sphere in order for these people to actually not be coherent into doing things they do not want to, as we will further explain in our third argument. But what I can tell you for now is that these people can still attend, for example, to private schools, to private places, private institutions in Iran where they can actually make use of these symbols, meaning that we live in a public sphere that keeps a civic identity, that keeps an atmosphere and environment that is equal for everybody where a civic identity is promoted by the state. But these people are still able to carry out their practices and feel identified and show their addition to their affiliation to religion in the private sphere. Now, um, moving on, regarding the point of discrimination, it is important to actually know here that if the state is not separated from religion as they consider, there will be a majority of religion, meaning that they will have more influence, the government will find these um, institutions of these majority religions, such as Christianism, Christianism, for example, as they conceive in their argument, and therefore it is because of this that we will see this Christianity majority actually having more power, having more influence, therefore meaning that we can see more abuse of these majorities over minority religions, meaning that we are actually less able to tackle these, these differences, to tackle this discrimination and to tackle this abuse because the state is supporting this religious um, majority. Apart from this, also note that on their side we get more segregation. Because we have a majority religion that is actually that actually has more influence and has more power because it's supported by the state, we get these minorities being discriminated when they actually have to adopt and they have to follow policies that are adapted and that are oriented with a basis of thank you on a specific religion. And it is essentially because of these reasons that these religious minorities feel marginalized in their state. We get more discrimination, we get more segregation, and of course we stand. Now, apart from this, also, um, it is important to note the fact that, um, no thank you, religions have flexibilized their time. We have seen, um, uh, eight years ago, it would have been probably inimaginable to think about LGBTQ community being accepted and being seen as sons of God. Um, years ago, it would have seemed impossible to see a lot of flexibilizations that we have seen in many different religions, essentially because when there is a change, um, these religions actually need to adapt 
um, to different societal needs that raise through time. We have seen this, for example, um, in the COVID pandemic. We saw um, different religious groups, no thank you, different religious groups actually flexibilizing in order for their people to carry out practices in a different way in order for them not to be so orthodox. And like this, they maintain their base of believers, they maintain their communities, and um, these religions are not um, negatively impacted by having such orthodox practices. So we told you that if the state is actually going to um, apply this strict secularism, many of these religions would actually become more flexible and therefore we wouldn't see such negative impact that they on their side claim would take place. Now, um, um, moving on to um, our third and last piece of substantive, no thank you, um, on how many spiritual centuries Western Iranian forces protect civil liberties. Now, two main ideas here. The first one regarding religious institutions, and the second one on religious symbols in public. Um, regarding religious institutions, note that, um, for example, such as religious schools, uh, some of these institutions actually put pressure on students to accept the beliefs and dogmas that are taught here. Sometimes this is done intentionally, but we believe most of the time this is done unintentionally, and this is by far worse because it is more difficult to actually identify. Different reasons for this. First of all, this education is under significant control from religious, from religious groups who have different incentives. For example, they are strongly motivated to ensure their religion is represented in an overwhelming positive light. Therefore, among their interests, we find expanding their uh, base of believers and maintaining their community. We're moving on. Yes, Should we also ban terms for black people in order to take out the difference in the population? No, not how it is essentially that um, these people can um, still carry out their practices in private, and it is essentially that we want to um, protect them and, um, um, and bring down this discrimination and this and um, actually promote assimilation by taking these symbols out of the public sphere. Know that it is because of this that we get more integration, we get more assimilation, since people do not perceive this religion as um, the thing that identifies others. They do not see this on the first side, meaning that they are not going to be driven by prejudice, by discrimination, they are just going to see another person which is going to promote assimilation. Now, moving on with what I was saying, note how the individuals in charge of this education are deeply rooted to this for example, um, avoiding certain actions to prevent punishment from divine elements. For example, being told from Jan in Islam that living that religion is a wrongdoing. Or for example, in Christianity, questioning your faith is considered a sin and you must confess. Therefore, religion is taught from an exclusive biased viewpoint, which is of, of, of also transmitted to students. And note that it is because of this that these structural reasons mean that in the majority of cases, these institutions lack objectivity when teaching beliefs. And Taking that into consideration, now moving on to symbols, mainly referred to clothing, as previously explained by our first speaker, note how, from proposition, we believe many of these, um, of these symbols are forced and imposed on individuals, maybe even without them realizing it, which is far worse. Um, for example, burqas or hijabs, which women use and undermine their individual freedoms, as they themselves conceive that in the majority of cases, they do not freely choose to wear them. Um, we have seen many in, for example, polls or different questions that have been taken out when these women are asked in public um, if they uh, actually choose to freely wear this clothing, um, they say that yes, they do, but in private, when the families aren't around, they actually refuse. And this happens in most cases, although we do recognize that there are some genuinely religious people, we will move on with that later. Um, therefore, we believe that there are inherent aspects of many religions that hinder civil liberties. Um, because in many cases people are, are tacitly conditioned to maintain the religion and are even less likely to drop this religion or switch it. Now, on our side, we have less funding, we don't have no funding for these religious institutions, meaning that we see less of these cases, we see not as a state incentivizing this system, and therefore we see resources that can be allocated into funding sectors with poor religious education. By prohibiting this system, we prevent people from being forced to use, uh, to use them if they do not want to. And it is essentially because of this that freedom of thought is the foundation of every democratic society and um, it is lost with, with no strict security. Thank you. I find it interesting how the opposition says that Western liberal democracy should protect people's rights, but I will protect the dignity and comfort out of every religious person that is in these countries. Proud to our folks. What are we going to hear in this speech? Firstly, on the principle, second, 
Wednesday on this religious too powerful or not, and thirdly on the corrosion of religion and which side is false. Let's begin with the principle of limitation. They have a few points on this. Firstly, they say there is no protection for religious minorities in the status quo. We believe that this is simply not true. Why? Because the state protects every religious minority. It's not some of these states hate crimes and punish under the law by years of prison, which means that they protect them even if they are not the official religion because they take the exact thing. They are citizens of the state. They live by the same rules as the other citizens of the state. So at the point where this is the case, we believe that these people are protected by the law and the government feeling their duty towards these religious minorities. Right. But secondly, not so. We can stop funding churches and not have a religion, uh, an official religion. This is something that could happen now outside if it's so horrible. The whole point of this debate is that they're burdened that they have to prove that everything is bad. They have to prove symbols are bad. They have to prove that all of these sort of things lead to negative impact. If we wanted to, we could support partial secularism so they don't feel their burden in this debate. I want to make sure here we don't support it because it's principally illegitimate. But at the point which we could support it, they can feel their burden and they like symbols are also as bad. Great. Now, thirdly, they say, ah, but like, we don't stop them from practicing this, they can practice it in, in their homes. But this is very scandalous because this is like saying, oh, LGBTQ people can kiss at home, but I don't see them kissing on the streets. This is extremely homophobic and extremely discriminatory towards these people because we infringe their dignity to, to express themselves in public. As my first speaker explained, this is like trans people wanting to look more like trans. It doesn't matter if they feel in private that they are trans, they have to express it for them to have a dignified life. The, the, the question from here is, it doesn't matter if they want to vote for somebody, but they can't go out and vote for him, and they want to vote for him in public. This doesn't matter. I have to have the right to express it in public, because otherwise my dignity is infringed. Right. Then, what else do they tell us? Let, let's go on to the second question, actually. The second question is, oh, is religion too, is religion too powerful? Not so. First, they want to flat. They never really prove this argument. Why does the church have so much lobbying power to literally pass policies? Or like, how do we, how does this disproportionate power look like? They just say, ah, we give them uh, later. They just say, ah, we give them cash money and they are better to become more powerful. We never understand how this mechanization works. What do they do with this money? How do they use it? These are things that have to be explained to them to an argument in this sort of way, right? But secondly, not how we believe or more constructively we believe, we believe religion, uh, we believe religion is getting more progressive even without their policy and now I'm going to explain why this is the line of case in this sort of way. Because you yourself say, oh, religion needs to adapt, this is something you say in second speech. We believe this is the case, but we believe they also adapt. Here are the structural reasons for this. Firstly, not so the organization of religion exists. This looks like uh, how hijabs look like, for instance, is never really described in the Quran in a very specified way in this sort of particular case. So to interpretation, so when liberal democracies can interpret it in their comfort later, can interpret it in their comfortable way in which it makes them feel good, which significantly mitigates the impact of these people feeling miserable from wearing hijab because they're greatly, uh, how do you say, adapted in the Western liberal democracies. But secondly, this is a process that has happened, the tendency that has happened. How does this look like? Previous people have been burned, for, burned to death for being LGBTQ. But now the Pope is allowed this to bless same-sex couples under specific conditions. This is the tendency that has happened for years. It's their burden to prove why this tendency won't continue happening. We just have to say it's, it's, it's happening to, to happen, right? But third, not so liberal people see meaning in religion and have created liberal, uh, see meaning in liberal religion but don't agree with every single religion thing they do, right? So they have created uh, liberal denominations of religion. This looks like LGBTQ churches, for instance, which support the ten unforgettable sins, but don't support that LGBTQ people should not get married. This denomination is great to wash down the religion and make it more liberal, because now it's more diverse and everybody can look into whatever church they want with their perfect, with their preferences and choices. Right. The bottom line of all this is the process of religion being more liberal is happen anyway. There is no point in not making these people on their side of the house. Following your logic, if the religions are getting more progressive in order to keep these believers, then they would also be able to flexibilize when it comes to symbols. No, no, here is the thing. Maybe they will be able to. 
but people will get mad. The current people, now that this is all possible, it takes years in this sort of way. So at the point that you just snap on the top, this policy is something that won't happen, right? Great. Then let's continue to, uh, let's finish the first argument then. Uh, so we, we've made the short-term impacts of backlash and isolation, but let's continue to the long-term impact. What we believe is likely to happen is that the people in minority regions that cannot go outside in their comfort are likely to most probably move to another country in this sort of particular way. This may seem back stretch, but it truly isn't, because this is the only logical thing they do for them to keep living a life that they believe they will go to Kevin home. This looks like people from the Muslim minority religion going to places like Afghanistan or Iran in which the healthcare system, the education system, the living standard is much worse just so that they don't have to feel like they're going to kill, which we believe is extremely important because we don't want to force individuals to make this incredibly horrible trade-off for them to significantly decrease their standard of living. Great. Then now, let's continue to the third argument and the third question is great, which the churches are likely to get more coercive factor on their side of the house. Why is this structure correct? Now, so the church has a small incentive to be more coercive. Why is this the case? I won't take any more of First, you know, some they're threatened by the state, which means they're desperate to stay alive, which means they will try all sorts of tactics, because otherwise they will simply fade away, so they at least it will at least work the try. But why do you say coercion works specifically well? Not so coercion is the most effective, because you can make people feel special by taking them, ah, all the fake believers are now gone, only the true believers may work in such a hard times, or otherwise you go to hell. Notice, this means that they get presented to be made, no other way for them to, uh, there's no other way for them to not suffer internal uh, non domination. Yes, okay. Uh, but third, why did the church get the ability to do this? Most of them capitalize on the age of religious people and why did they capitalize the more to secure them? This looks like most of people stay at the church more on their side. Why? Because it's the only place to express yourself. They can find at the this is a, you know, go to the church is the only place where you can wear a hijab and talk to people. This is the only place where you can socialize comfortably and socialization is very important to us as human individuals. So they like to spend more time in the church. This basically means that they have more time to coerce in this sort of particular way, to spread this sort of lies. But secondly, notice how, uh, yeah, they can change the holy scripture and the holy interpretation of the holy scripture. This is something they can do, they have the official authority of this. But how they like to coerce? There are three main things they will do. First, they will make a donate and a donate more to the church. Secondly, they are likely to send their kids to religious schools even more now and to demand this even more now to keep them in those areas which flips their case. But thirdly, they are likely to isolate you from other communities so that you don't go out of the church and only talk with the church community to make life safe from your friends. Uh, and yeah, the, 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 they won't do this on our side of the house because the state has the incentive to regulate them and they are afraid of losing their state from you. For all these things of both of us. I want everyone to note that before starting this debate, we were already, already ready, very clear. We told you about policies such as separating church from state, about not funding religious institutions, but opposition only wanted to focus on the symbols. We tell you that in this sense, Team Proposition has already the vast majority of the debate. One, because they did not engage with how this actually affects political systems or institutions in these countries. Furthermore, the fact that we actually give you information about the status quo shows that something must be done. Opposition needs to provide a solution to the problems of discrimination we see in the status quo. This being said, three points of clash for this debate. First, on rights, second, on discrimination, third, on politics. First, on rights. And the big push here was about freedom of religion. They told us that, oh, but a person has the freedom to follow their religion. No, crucially, that even on our side, people can still fully think freely. And we actually gave you mechanization that's not been fully responded to yet. In our third argument, that all people, when they're surrounded by religious institutions, do not always have the possibility to fully do this because sometimes they do feel pressure from those around them to, con to confer to a certain religion. But second, we told you that the religions themselves can actually flexibilize. We give you examples of this happening. Two big incentives of religions, why this is actually very likely to be the case. First, religions have a big incentive to actually maintain the following, that is, the people that follow them, because first, because they genuinely believe it, and because they want to help other people believe the same thing that they believe. That's precisely why we see the church actually changing the rhetoric around homosexuality as society becomes 
more progressive because they genuinely want people to follow them. But secondly, because religions at their core are out of the way in which you act in the circumstances that you are, that means that any, that any god is going to be unfair to you just because you weren't able to do something. That's precisely why we see Islam allowing people to actually eat pork if there is no other option and it's necessary. It's why we see Buddhist monks being able to break their diet, their diet, certain dietary conditions if it's actually needed by illness. And therefore, we do believe that it's very clear that religions are very likely to become more flexible in response to this policy. Freedom of religion is not broken. But their second big push here was on freedom of expression. And I want to note that we're since first we still told you about how people can still freely express themselves. People can still freely say what they believe. The problem is when they use symbols in a way that's very superficial and creates more division. But notice too how their third argument we also gave you, gave you about how certain people that feel pressure by society to convert a certain religion sometimes do not have this same freedom. They do not feel like they can express dissent because their very government is pushing them to be part of a certain religion. They do not feel the freedom to do otherwise without breaking their faith to their own country. I think that at the end of the day, this debate is about a balance of rights. And we tell them that it's true that it, it is going to be in the short term, perhaps very uncomfortable, perhaps even horrible for some people, but we tell you that in the long term, we're going to be able to solve this, the problems that face society. We tell you that the freedom of thought and the actual, and the actual ability to be able to choose without feeling worship by your own government, by the symbols of the people around you, is what's very important at the end of the day. Second point of clash on discrimination and isolation. I want to know, we told you about how having a religious state feel, leads some people to actually feel coerced to follow their own country's religion. And notice how their very frame on how religion is very important to people plays into this as well. They even told us that people can only socialize in church. We tell you that the fact that some religious communities are so close in amongst themselves is in, its, is in itself what leads to isolation. We tell you that if you have a society where schools are funded by the government and the religious schools, people are very likely to only meet people of their own religion, leading to this very isolation that we're concerned about. But finally, we tell you that when they see others using symbols, there's uh, an us versus them mentality is established that hurts society as a whole. Because you never actually get any meaningful integration because people feel like they're pitted up against each other. And this actually gets even worse when you have politics intertwined with religion. Because what you can even see is that disagreements from politics actually transform themselves into disagreements in religion. Someone disagrees on their point on abortion and they dislike others' religion because it's what leads to that first disagreement. And it's even worse, and the very consequence of this, and the reason why we get this, is when you can instantly see another person's religion and therefore act on that in a way that's discriminatory. Yes? I think that there are many other reasons as to why people don't agree with LGBTQ marriage or abortion. Please explain why this is the unique reason as to why this happens. It doesn't have to be the unique reason, but we tell you that it's one of the main reasons. Because the fact that you can have people that are growing up completely separate from each other, the fact that they're being literally told that it's a matter of life and death to follow something is a reason. It's the very reason why they're actually very likely to feel that they're in a way judgmental to others who think different to, towards them. The fact that they find it that something so cool to them might be the reason, and the fact that others think that they think that might be the reason why others uh, act in such hateful manners. But secondly, I want to note on their point about backlash, because their main counter to this was to say that yeah, that there's going to be a big backlash from these communities. We tell you that first, we told you that these villages are likely to flexibilize, because even in their codes, they are already telling you that it, it's about being fair, it's about what you can do in the circumstances in which you find yourselves. But even if you get some backlash in the short term, we tell you that it's clearly worth it for getting more integration in the long term, for actually having uh, plural societies that can actually get very different people to actually live together. I want to note that the society in which we live in today is one in which the Western liberal democracies are becoming more and more pluralized, more and more diversity, and unfortunately, this is only, only creating more discrimination. Something needs to be done, a change is needed, a more secular state is the way to solve it. But now I want to talk about our third point of clash on religion and politics, but first, we have a point. So, the death of people in violence process is something okay as long as we like, uh, make that more open. What we're saying 
is that eventually you need to stop uh, supporting, uh, supporting and allowing these structures, such as actually having a government, a, a government running on the basis of a certain religion, especially because this completely alienates people from other religions in this point of class, which are precisely about religion and politics. Which is that when you actually have funding for religious institutions, or you actually have politicians carrying symbols, or even their entire campaign being focused on support to a certain religion, it's completely inevitable to have religion intertwined with politics. This leads to cases like the UK, where we see unelected bishops forming a part of parliament. And we told you about two big impacts of this. First, to the discourse, which is that this results first in completely anti democratic policies. Why? Because what you actually see is sometimes policy being dictated not only by the rational discourse taking place, but only by a certain group's adherence, perhaps even getting a loud minority to have a disproportionate impact. But second, it really it negatively affects people and religious institutions as a whole because it creates a negative image on them. Why? Because when we see a politician making use of religious messaging only to sell a certain message, you actually make it worse. Uh, you actually make their image of that religion worse because it's associated to a negative uh, of a politician. For all of these reasons, a secular society is an equitable society. Yeah. 
have to do, for example, the concept of the Messiah that sacrificed himself for uh, of the people, or the concept of fasting and sacrificing food for the religion. These are things that people are taught in the Bible and in the biblical text that they have to do and that they are good, so they're going to continue perceiving symbols as something necessary in order to be righteous. But, okay, P1. Why is it then that you actually got people in France completely uh, stopping using their job if it's so important? These are the people that don't care about their hijabs. These are the people who probably don't wear their hijabs. This policy didn't happen. They're pretty symmetric, so they're not discriminated upon, and you also don't have a case on that. Okay, why is it, is it principally just in order uh, to wear your symbols, uh, even if you, uh, even if it's the expense of practical hands, like having, uh, uh, like having uh, the equality of people? Notice, one, the basic right of feeling like you're human is a right that you need in order to fix other types of life. What do I mean? If I don't feel like a human and I am gay, I have to feel like a human, I have to feel worthy of having an opinion, I need to have an opinion, I have to be able to cast that opinion, for example, in voting, in order to change the system and get equality, which is something that they're trying to argue about. So in some, in some sort of way, humanity that we're trying to argue for is a precondition to every single other right that we as people have in this world. But also, to notice on exclusivity, we believe that in Western liberal democracies there are a hundred million uh, other ways in order to get this sort of equality, for example, to social movements, to, uh, to other trades in society like liberalism uh, and without banning religion, without causing the potential harms on our side of the house, versus the only way to grant these people dignity is telling them, hey, you can be who you want 100% of the time. But also, even if you don't buy that way in, uh, on principality, notice how the practical harms of our arguments are much worse than theirs. Feeling like you're going to go to hell is definitively much worse than you being discriminated against. Why? A. The right to feeling humane, again, is the way to solve other types of discrimination, but you B. Uh, you not feeling humane, what happens to happens to you 100% of the time is binary. You, are, you either have dignity or you don't. Versus, you only experience discrimination, for example, when you enter some sort of discriminative uh, environment uh, that is not safe for you. Uh, what is the bottom line? Uh, uh, but also on that, notice how when you feel like you're going to suffer forever versus only while you're living on their side of the house, but also you feel like everything about you is bad because you're a sinner versus just the color of your skin or just your sexuality on their side of the house. We believe that the most important and fundamental thing in this debate is for people to feel like they're good, humane beings that have the ability to explain, uh, to express their opinions. And lastly, all coercion uh, that they're trying to argue for on their side of the house. Why this doesn't work? Why? And why is it not important? I'm taking more. One, well, notice how these children that go into the schools can still be coerced by their parents without the religious symbol. Their parents can still tell them, hey, God is the only way in order to be a good person. I will disown you if you don't pray. Uh, uh, pray. So, uh, again, in regards to this policy, these children will be able to be anyway. So please don't interrupt me. There are, but also, these children can opt out later in life. They can grow up, they can change their opinions versus people being stripped away from their dignity by the law. It's not something that can happen. And lastly, all this they are, by definition, they are trying to argue for a country that is discriminative of its people. Notice this is the same government that is going to impose their policy as well. In, intuitively, it is going to happen in a discriminative way that we are trying to frame. So they are only increasing the influence that this discriminative government has over the people and their social interactions. But also, notice, by definition, this motion is discriminative in the moment in which symbols are directly related to, uh, to, to Muslim people. For example, if you are a Christian, not much others is required from you. Versus other religions have to pray five times a day, they have to wear the jobs. This, this, if, if you believe that uh, people have the right to express themselves in order to uh, be good human beings, in order to minimize discrimination of minorities, please vote for opposition. Team opposition brings a lot of constructive claims in this debate, however, unfortunately, they fail to prove them to a significant extent. Like, they say discrimination for instance, but they never explain how discrimination particularly affects people, why it's an incredibly large problem, why it doesn't happen on their side of the house as well. They say policies, but they never explain why policies are searching so far for people. They never explain why these policies don't happen on their side of the house as well. At the point in debate, you have to prove alternatives and how it's better on our side of the house. 
House, we believe we both get the bomb this debate. Let's continue by two parts of this debate. First, we the principal one, second, from the practical one. Firstly, let's talk about the principal part. Point. Not so, they never truly get with our principal. They just kind of throw me and say, ah, but you can be mostly with private. I don't get anything quite this problematic in my speech, and I believe for conspiracy people it is too late to come in court. So let's take this argument and explain why this argument is the most important argument in this debate. It is for twofold reasons. Firstly, we decided no practical arguments for principles like self-expression that are the base of our democracy. Please notice, if we didn't have self-expression principles, nobody would be able to vote, so there would be no democracy. So this is a key principle for democracy, right? Notice, what are the intuition points here? Notice how a far-right person voting may bring a large practical, uh, practical uh, uh, maybe great practical inconvenience, and if this person was elected, but we still allow him to vote because this is self-expression. Or for example, if there were great practical benefits of folks feeding a Muslim folk, we still wouldn't do it because it is practically illegitimate to sentence this person in hell. Right. But the second comparative point to this is the uh, segregation policies, power of the church, all these things are very speculative. Like every country has different levels of discrimination of policies that depend on arbitrary factors like who is in power and all these sort of things. I want to find that their case, for instance, does not do pretty much anything in Switzerland, where abortion is legal, where LGBT marriage is legal, where all these things happen. Right. However, our principal argument does do things in Switzerland and it does do things in every country that is Western liberal democracy because it infringes the principle in every single one of these countries to the same great extent. So simply on scale, this on scale and depthless, this question is the most important one. We win it, so we should basically win the debate. But let's actually get to the practical part because I believe we win that one as well. Not so. Firstly, we have refuted their claims. They like have explained why discrimination doesn't happen so often in the whole hate crimes in Dodo, in the third speech, also great in Dodo's right. But also the, uh, the policy, uh, yes, but the policy seems to explain that there are other reasons that they never put this argument with all this. But they, let's take out this hypothesis, presume they were never given. Let's give you the comparative here. The practical harm is much larger on our side of the house. First, on that, not so people being isolated or feeling like they were born in hell much bigger existential fear than discrimination. Like, once again, they never explain how discrimination looks like, so this is some sort of a very vague impact. They never explain the psychological harms of this, they never explain the practical harms of this, they never explain this. And the point of this is the case of the existential threat and the existential human threat of you being isolated at your home or moving to a different country that is much worse. We believe that to give a tangible, practical impact that impacts the individual on a daily basis that make the individual suffer, that do not, uh, that, yeah, yes, uh, so basically, ah yes, which you need the discrimination still happens on their side of the house, like, for example, if you don't discriminate on the hijab, you discriminate on the skin color, like, if people want to discriminate, they're going to do this either way, because they will find something to do this, the other side is maybe, while this is the unique way to strip religious people out of their rights, so on the basis of the English law, so for all these things,
they have said is that even if this was true, they wouldn't still be seeing this in of masculinity bad because of the coercion that their communities have brought onto them. And precisely because of this, we are telling you that it is so important to ban this and to have strict secularism in order to uh, give a legal framework to protect the freedom of thought of these individuals. And another point, religious texts are highly uh, are subjected to interpretation. They have said that it is not actually true, which we know that it is. And so therefore we saw in France many Muslim women uh, not stopping to go to school, but actually taking off their hijabs after the 2004 law was passed. And on freedom of expression, people can still express themselves in the parts of the house with words and through other things, but not with symbols that actually segregate them and make them uh, be seen as individuals of religious affiliations rather than equal citizens as everyone. And they haven't engaged on our point on how this actually hinders discourse by uh, mixing dogmatic uh, arguments with the arguments that should be prioritized in a democracy. And then they said that we would actually have uh, discrimination in the application of these policies, in which on our side of the house we literally defined in the first speech that uh, by having strict secularism we would not be allowing any targeted policies, but on their side of the house we have examples such as Belgium, the city of school, that has banned directly burqas, not all religious symbols, and so therefore we think that this disproportionate and unequal affront is forced on their side of the house. And even if it disproportionately affects the sector of the population, we would not stop, for instance, uh, promoting vaccines because it goes against more one's beliefs because it's still necessary to uphold in a society. And then on religion, what we said is that we basically must at first glance get the religion of these people because prejudice exists. We have either segregation or violence. And we have mentioned clear statistics of this and they have not provided any solution for this. And so they have said only that they're more likely to be loved in order to not go out of their homes. But note that first, if religion is capitalized, then this won't happen. Second, that these Western democracies have actually power to protect these individuals' rights. For instance, when the French did not allow an American citizen to gain citizenship because he was forcing his wife to work a burqa, and so therefore protections can be instituted. And if they trust the police to protect these individuals, why wouldn't they trust the state to then protect them when these things happen? There is a clear contradiction on their side of the house. And they have said that funding religious institutions is bad, which is something that continues happening on their side of the house, once again, contradicting themselves. And they have not engaged with our point on how religions become political tools and how we actually are hindering these religious individuals and coercing them and curtailing their freedom of thought. And because of all of this, 